Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. This is Emmett Blackwell. First, I want to thank everyone for listening. Also, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. On this episode, I will be speaking with finance guru turned historical fiction author, Patty Hirsch. He has been an editor for NPR's Marketplace and has hosted Marketplace Whiteboard. He is currently working on NPR's Planet Money. His new book, The Devil's Half Mile, is a fictional take on a very dark time in U.S. history. We will talk about his choice to write a fictional story, the importance that history plays in today's world, and how all the research he has done has helped to shape his characters. So, without any further ado, let's begin. Patty Hirsch proudly presents The Devil's Half Mile. Seven years after a financial crisis nearly toppled America, traders chafe at government regulations. Racial tensions are rising, gangs roam the streets, and corrupt financiers make backdoor deals with politicians. 1799 was a hell of a year. Thanks to Alexander Hamilton, America has recovered from the panic on the Devil's Half Mile, aka Wall Street, but the young country is still finding its way. When young lawyer, Justy Flanagan, returns to solve his father's murder, he exposes a massive fraud that has already claimed lives, and one the perpetrators are determined to keep secret at any cost. The body count is rising, and the looming crisis could topple the nation. Get The Devil's Half Mile by Patty Hirsch wherever books are sold. All right, and I am back with author Patty Hirsch. And um, Patty, how are you doing out there? Um, very well, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me today. Oh, no problem. So your book, it's historical fiction. Um, but you were an uh, NPR person. You were working with NPR's uh, Marketplace, and you were working um, as the host of the Whiteboard Marketplace. The what, and you do all this financial stuff. What made you make that choice of going into fiction? Well, uh, while I was working at Marketplace, and I work for NPR now, for Planet Money, so I'm still on the financial side, but while I was at Marketplace, uh, I wrote a book called Man vs. Markets, which is a kind of an explainer of the financial markets, mm -hmm. and uh, I wanted to kind of write a sequel to that. I really wanted to write about the way that a financial exchange is created, and the, the most financial exchanges in the world have been created like over time, like you know, the London Stock Exchange or the Amsterdam Stock Exchange, the Dutch Bourse. They were created was over, you know, many, many years. But the New York Stock Exchange was created very, very quickly uh, in the aftermath of the, the panic, the Great Panic of 1792. Like a bunch of guys got together and they're like, oh my gosh, this system really needs some rules in order to make sure that we don't get ripped off and this, you know, this kind of nightmare doesn't happen again. We should like create an exchange. They, mm -hmm. they created this exchange. So I really wanted to write this story, like a nonfiction story, but in a kind of a very in a dramatic way mm -hmm. and I was doing all this research and I was reading you know reading letters between Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson and Frank I've got to tell you but frankly I got rather bored <laughs> plus I wasn't doing any writing I was doing a lot of research so I kind of wrote a little murder into the narrative just as like a side project mm -hmm. and to be honest the, the the side project just took over and I ended up just like writing about the, the murder mystery as opposed to writing about the um, the actual history which has been consigned to a drawer. Yeah, and who doesn't like a little bit of murder in their history, you know? Right. I mean, that's why kids it's, read history books, right? <laughs> that's the most compelling type of history is when people are, like, knocking each other off. Absolutely. <laughs> a whole bunch of mafias came out of that stuff, didn't it? Um, totally. Yeah. So now in your book, The Devil's Half Mile, the setting is during that wake of the U.S. financial crisis. Uh, you got corruption, you got gangs, you got crimes running amok, you got undertable deals with politicians, murders are happening all the time including the murder of the main character's father, Justy Flanagan. Um, now, how did that history help shape the story, that the, the murder story behind it? Well, you know, you, when you hear about 
financial crises. I mean, particularly the the great uh, panic, you know, the, or the great financial panic that happened, um, you know, in the early 1900s. You heard about people sort of hurling themselves out of windows. You know, people like you know, killed themselves, mm-hmm. and people also killed themselves in the panic of 1792. It's like the people lost all their money, and you know, so people did take their own lives, and that seemed to me to be. You know, when you have that kind of when you have that kind of chaos, that chaos creates opportunity. So if you're a murderer, you want to off somebody, that's a great time to do it. Is in a time of great turmoil because you can always say, well, it's, you know, plausible deniability. He, he wasn't murdered; he probably killed himself. So if you do it right, and you're a good murderer. <laughs> you could probably cover it up pretty well. So I thought, well, that's, there's a there's a plausible way of of actually covering this up. So that's that's kind of why I I, I went for that. Yeah, and then you have to think about all those poor street cleaners that had to clean up after that mess. Right. <laughs> although, although, although back then, in 1792, the buildings weren't really high enough. You know, they were really oh. only three stories high. So if you hurled yourself off a roof, yeah, you probably weren't going to do that much damage. I mean, you might, obviously, if you landed the right way. But it's not like today where, you know, you're 36 stories up. You're definitely going to do the job if you do that. Yeah, yeah. So not only do you have to be good at being a murderer in that time period, you also have to be good at killing your own self by jumping off a building the right way so that you don't don't just hurt yourself. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's it's not it's not intuitive. <laughs> So now, with all the history that you got in this thing, okay, were you a history buff growing up? Not really. I actually didn't like history very much. Uh, you know, it's interesting when I look back at the choices that I made for, for the exams that I took and the way that I streamed my courses, I, I, I streamed history out very, very early on. And I think, you know, to, to me, this is all about who your teachers are, right? And you know, if you've got a great teacher, they're going to make you interested in a certain subject. And obviously, if you have aptitude in that subject. But I didn't have very, I don't think I had good history teachers when I was a kid. And also, you know, all the history that I read, it's always so dull. I mean, even if you're talking about battles and wars and all this crazy stuff, I just wasn't really that interested in that history. And it wasn't until I bumped into uh, fiction writers like, uh, I mean, my favorite is George MacDonald Fraser, who wrote uh, a book about, about a series of books about the, the anti-hero Flashman, mm. who, is this, who is this character taken from Tom Brown's school days that he puts into... Uh, all of the um, the campaigns um, uh, during uh, Queen Victoria's reign of the British Army overseas. And then I was like, oh, wow, this is really interesting because you had this really interesting character. And of course, he was fictional, but all of the history around this character was absolutely true. And then I got really fascinated in it. So I started reading as many kind of historical fiction writers as I could possibly find, the, the types that were very kind of true to um, history as, as they read it. So... Uh, you know, people like um, uh, Bernard Cornwell, who writes the uh, a, a, a number of series. One of his series about a, a, a character called Sharp, who's a sergeant who becomes an officer in Queen Victoria's army, and then also in the British army. And also, he writes about uh, the, the the Saxon chronicles about this kind of sort of type of Viking type guy who works for. Uh, um, King Alfred, but you know, in the very early stages of British history. So, you know, these these writers are absolutely meticulous mm-hmm. about their history, but they have a fictional character in the place. So, that's those are the people that really got me in, interested in history. But that was much later on. I mean, that wasn't until I was in my thirties that I started to read those people. Yeah, and you know, it's kind of funny too because with people, you know, you got people, and they will repeat how they how they act amongst each other. Okay. So like you can have the history, you can take something from like the 1600s and the the same interactions that people have still apply today. You know, yeah. they, they still have those same interactions, which then just builds up characters like you wouldn't believe. I think that's the secret to the historical fiction author is that they, they apply what's happening today to the things that happened back then and, and basically see how they're going to react. You know that's really interesting. I mean, there's there's a lot that happens in the Devil's Half Mile that you can that you can reflect back on what happened in 1792. I mean, one of the really interesting conversations that we're having right now, um, with the Trump administration dealing with, uh, you know, Wall Street, is the whole issue of regulation, right? I mean, you you have banks that are saying, you know, we should be able to regulate ourselves, and this, you're seeing this this strong regulatory rollback, you know, rollback of all of the rules that were put in place in the Dodd-Frank Act, which came into, into play after the financial crisis of 2008. Mm-hmm. Well, the fact is that those conversations, because on one side you've got people saying, no, we need stronger regulation. On the other side you've got people saying, no, 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 we can be, we can be allowed to self-regulate. That was exactly the conversation that was going on in 1792 mm-hmm. between Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson. You know, Thomas Jefferson was very much kind of laissez-faire, 
we can we can be trusted to rule our own affairs. Whereas Hamilton was saying, you know, we absolutely need to put some rules around this thing because when you have fear and greed and lots and lots of money, then you know you need to have rules because that turns men into children. Yeah. And, um, you know, so it's, it is that there are, there are fascinating comparisons. You know, it's, I, I find that really interesting. Yeah, it just kind of makes you wonder what Alexander Hamilton would have said if he had a Twitter page. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. you know. I don't know. Is there is there an Alexander Hamilton fake Twitter account? I bet there is. If there isn't, there should be. Maybe yeah, there should, should be. There should be. You'd be the guy to start it. I tell you, <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> so now. You the fiction, okay? It's all about the characters that you create, right? And you have a YouTube channel that deals with finances. Um, and I was looking at it earlier today. It's really cool. I mean, you go through quite a bit dealing with um, what people need to prepare themselves for the financial market, tips and and things like that. And if anybody's out there listening and you haven't heard of uh, Patty Hirsch's YouTube channel, check it out. It's got a lot of good information. Now, do you think that helping people with their finances allows you to connect with people? and kind of develop your characters in that way? I mean, the connection between finances and people, it's its still a people connection, right? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I'm very interested in the way, in people, in the psychology of money, right? You know, in the way that people behave when it comes to their financial affairs. And I, and I, and I would side with, you know, Alexander Hamilton in this debate he had with Thomas Jefferson. I, I actually think that, you know, when you've got a lot of money sloshing around the place, you know, and, and the, 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 the emotions that rule the market are fear and greed, right? Yeah. You know, it, it's, and, and if, you, if you don't know much about what's going on, then you have more fear and you probably have more greed if you don't really know how things work that well. And that means that you're going to be, because of those, those emotions are so strong and the amount of money is often so large. I mean, comparatively speaking, it, it can make you or break you, right? Mm-hmm. That that toxic, potentially toxic combination. If you don't have, if you're not in possession of all the facts, you're you're gonna you're gonna come a cropper in some way. You're gonna screw up, right? Mm-hmm. Either you're gonna either you're gonna cheat and do something wrong and illegal, or you're gonna get screwed by someone who's who's cheating you. And I think that for me, it, in a situation like that, when you have a complicated market and you've got lots of money involved, you need to know what's going on. So I'm very keen to make sure what I want to do and my mission with both the nonfiction book that I wrote and also the, the, the whiteboard explainer series is to try to get people. And in fact, the work that I do now at planet money is to try and get people to understand how things work because knowledge is power. And the more, you know, and the better you understand the systems that are in place, the less likely you are, you know, to lose your shirt, you know, to lose your house, mm-hmm. you know, to lose your family because you know, that's the way it can, that's the way it can impact potentially to lose your life, mm-hmm. you know, so, um, you know, I, I think that, that those are the kind of the things that drive me in that respect. And, and I, you know, looking at that with my characters, I, I mean, I really like to make that comparison with the characters and bring, and, you know, have the characters and play that way too. Yeah. And you'd have to think about it this way too. Um, just like how you, how you look at history and you see that there's certain portions that repeat itself. I'm sure that you have done historical research on the markets to determine what's going to happen in the future. And, what direction people should be taking. Because like you said, they could do something to where they make a mistake. They could lose everything they own. But we have tons of history on historical markets, and it plays out just like people do because it's a people-run thing, is that you see repeats. You know, you see different trends. You see ways that that things move, and you can either correct it in the future or you can come up with a different strategy. Do you kind of incorporate that with your videos and and with your work? Well, once again, I mean, I, I would hate, I would hesitate to, in, to, to, um, to imply that I have a crystal ball and I can see into <laughs> the future. If only I did, I'd be a very wealthy man. But no, and then I could write all the time. But <laughs> no, I mean, for, for me, it's like, you know, I think that we look back and history tells us that we make the same mistakes over and over again, systemically, like as an economy. I mean, we, you can see it, you can see it playing out now. I mean, one of the things that we saw in the run up to, to, to the bubble that was created in sort of in the early 2000s, the run up to that was was a period of deregulation. They started stripping the rules out. Mm-hmm. And as soon as you do that and you don't put any controls in place, you've got the sort of the venality of people who are just desperate to make money in a boom. 
you know, you, that people are going to start to make mistakes. They're going to start to overestimate their own abilities. They're going to start to see what they can do to squeeze money out of people who maybe shouldn't have the money squeezed out of them, you know, old grannies and people on Social Security and all the rest of it. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we, we've seen this happening before, but yet still, once again, we're stripping the rules out and, you know, I, you can you, know, you stand back from this and you can see it happening. So there's nothing, I, and, you know, I think as individuals, we're pretty much powerless when it comes to the system. So you, we can we can make this argument all we want, but nobody's really listening to us. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at where you do have control. You have you have control over your own finances, right? You have control over your, the way you live your own life. So make sure you don't make those mistakes. Look back at the way that people behaved in 2004, 2005. You know the the the, the, the massive borrowing, the over leverage. You know the, the 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 taking out liar loans where they you know they basically fooled themselves and says, oh, I don't need to. So I don't need to put any. Um, I don't need to have any kind of backstop financially. I can just borrow as much money as I want. Don't make those mistakes, right? Don't overspend. Learn mm -hmm. how to budget. You know. So if you have those skills in place, you're not making the mistakes that we've that, that a lot of people made. A lot of Americans, not just Americans, a lot of people around the world made in the early 2000s. And that means that then you, at the very least, you yourself are going to be safe, even if the system is sort of collapsing around you. And of course, if the whole system goes, then what are you going to do? But that's that's not really likely to happen. So I say, save yourself, you know, save yourself by learning from these mistakes. Politicians aren't going to learn from these mistakes. Bankers aren't going to learn from these mistakes. You know, the stakes, they're thinking about different things. They're thinking about getting reelected. They're thinking about maximizing value for shareholders. They're mm -hmm. not thinking about the things that you and I are thinking about. So I say, look at what you have control over, take control over that by understanding how that stuff works, learning and learning from your, the mistakes of the people who went before you. Yeah, and, and that's one thing, too, with the financial market. I mean, you've got all this history that you know about now that you've gotten you know into history. And all this information that you have, and, and you kind of look at the system and you go, okay, well, we could do it this way or that way. Another question that I have, though, because you have all this information about, you know, the past and, and what time frames you, you've looked at about, you know, financial things and stuff like that. Let's just say, for example, you were a time traveler. What mm. time travel would you, or what, what time would you travel back to? Ooh, wow, what time would I travel back to? Well, I think it would actually be pretty recent, to be honest, mm. because, you know, I'm a big fan of dentistry. <laughs> and I have to say, when I think about these things, because I do think about these things, I'm like, it's not so much the time that I would like to be in, because I, I kind of like to be, you know, I, I, the Roman Empire kind of appeals to me. You know, if I was, mm -hmm. you know, in the in the good top part of the Roman Empire before it started to, to sort of crumble, that seems like it would be kind of cool. If you were like a, a person of rank in Rome, if you if you didn't have any rank, it'd be a nightmare. You know. Mm -hmm. So, but, but I think the, the thing that I really like the idea of is um, uh, Britain during that 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 phase of expansion when the empire was expanding, and you had people that were you know, kind of exploring the world and, you know, finding these cultures that nobody even knew about and, you know, getting to grips with, with people that we didn't even know existed in, in lands that we had no idea were, were there. That's the kind of, I think that's the, the period that appeals to me because at least you had some technology, you could get around relatively quickly, you know, there was some medicine which kind of, you know, would, would increase your longevity a little bit, but, um, it, it was still kind of adventurous and kind of cool. So I think I would say, and, and also that's a period that I've kind of steeped myself in historically, which is why I, I really like it. So I would say that Victorian age mm. and, you know, British military, I think I, that's, that's the kind of age that I, I would like. Yeah. And you actually, you served in the military, didn't you? I did. I served in uh, Her Majesty's glorious Corps of Royal Marines. I was an officer in the, in the Royal Marines for 10 years in the UK. Well, well, just like we tell anybody here on the show who's been a U.S. Uh, vet, okay, thank you so much for your service. It doesn't matter if you're here in the U.S. or not. Um, if you're serving your country in, in one capacity or another, I'm talking good side and bad side. It doesn't matter. You're giving a, quite a bit of yourself to that, and I do appreciate you for doing that. So thank you. Well, that's kind of you, but I, I, have, to, I have to tell you a story. At one point, um, I, I used to work for a general. His name was Robin Ross, and he was uh, the Commandant General of the Royal Marines. And we visited the United States Marines um, uh, in Quantico, and we went to a dinner. And um, my general stood up, and he was giving the keynote speech. And he, he, he had to apologize because his great, 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 whatever, grandfather was actually the general, the Major General Ross, who burned Washington, D.C. to the ground 
in the uh, in the second um, uh, uh, in the second part of the Revolutionary War. So, you know, we've we've done some bad things to our American cousins in the past, but we're all friends now. Yeah, and that's the thing, though. I I mean, when it comes to serving your country, if if the orders come down and say that these are the orders, you know, you got to do them, and and that's where it's like. That's why I think that the, the Americans and the U.S. or I'm sorry, the the U.S. and the British can kind of come to terms and say, you know what, we were just doing our jobs, just like everybody else in the world. We were just doing our jobs, so don't hate us as as individuals. And that's where I think everybody in the world should just kind of get along. But you know, we, we're not. This, that isn't that kind of podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, back to your book. Now, the New York Times has said that your book is a thriller with strong, multifaceted heroes and villains and tight plotting. Now, how blurry do you make the lines between the protagonists and the antagonists? Because you know, you can read a story and sometimes you can sympathize with an antagonist. What what kind of blurs have you made in your story? Well, I think it's really important for you to, to to empathize to some extent with your antagonist. I mean, obviously your protagonist, he, he's great, but also, you know, he or she needs to have a, they can't be perfect, right? I mean, they've got to have a little dirt on them. Otherwise, mm-hmm. they're not really that interesting. If they're, so they're all like super clean cut and all the rest of this. If they're all Superman, you know, I'm really, I'm just not that interested. You know, it's like, let's let's have a little little conflict there because you want to have conflict I think within the character as well as within, within the story that just makes things more interesting yeah and then and it, way, yeah it helps shape the motivation of why these characters are doing what they're doing too right because sometimes they have to do bad good people have to do bad things right in order to get stuff done I mean you know that's that's just a fact of life and I think that it's good to have that reflected in in a narrative and but the same thing goes for the antagonists you know you've got you got you got bad people doing bad things but you know why are they doing it? They're usually doing it for a very human reason, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it's like whether it's you know self-preservation, whatever whatever that motivation is, that selfish motivation. Nine times out of ten, I think we can we as human beings can probably relate to it, even if the things that they're doing is really bad. I mean, you know, you're kind of psychosexual serial killer type thing mm-hmm. where they're just completely deranged. I mean, that's I think that's a whole other thing, and you know, I think it's really interesting the whole um, Hannibal Lecter thing who, you know, is just a completely bad man, but people somehow still manage to relate to him in some way. I mean, that's a great feat to me. You know, people still had some sympathy for Hannibal Lecter locked up in his cage, even though he's like, you know, eating people's liver with a, with a nice Chianti. You know, <laughs> he's, 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 people still like this guy for some reason. He's still kind of appealing. And I, but I think that's really, really important. Otherwise, it's, it's just going to turn people off. It's like, you know, no, nobody wants... Nobody wants to read about people that are just just one dimensional. I just think even if they think that they do, once they start reading that one dimensional person, it's just not that. There's really not, nothing that interesting. And I think that one of the really the things I like to do is to bring out in a character a trait that everybody will see in themselves. So it's like, oh, yeah, I can't hate that guy too much because sometimes I feel like that way myself. You know, whether it's envious or you know or you know, hatred for something or, you know, rage or lust or whatever it is, any of the seven deadly sins, you know what I mean? Mm. I think those, you know, we all have those, we all suffer from those things. So to have them reflected in the character, uh, to have you be able to connect to those in, in the character, I think is really, really important. Yeah. And, and that's really important too, with um, like the point that you made about having people just relate, you know, it's, it's something that's a magical thing with fiction. Okay, is these characters only exist in your own mind, and it's you almost have to pull yourself out of yourself to be these different characters for that brief amount of time to say, you know what, what would I do in this situation? How would I react? Or sometimes you have to rely on you know the people you know and just be like, okay, how would they react? So you can fit it all in, and then it just it flows. Did you when you went from like this financial market stuff into authoring a book? Did you find a lot of differences in it? Did you, was it like a different world to you? I mean, yeah. I mean, one of the interesting things about fiction is that a lot of people say, wow, it's got to be so much easier than nonfiction, right? Because you can just make everything up. And initially I thought, well, yeah. And then I, but then I realized, well, no, because in many ways, nonfiction is a lot less complicated because really nonfiction is about finding out facts, right? And then Mm -hmm. arranging those facts in a coherent and compelling way. And neither of those things is easy, right? It's not easy to find out all the facts and make sure that everything's right. It's, it's hard to be that meticulous. It's, it's a lot of work. And, and getting the arrangement right, 
that's not easy either. You know, you could do it in, a, in seven different ways, you know, a dozen different ways, and, and getting it right is it's hard. It's a hard balancing act. But at least you don't have to mix shit up. You know what I mean? Excuse oh yeah. My French. You, you, at least at least you don't have to make stuff up. And that's the thing. It's like when you're writing fiction, you got to make stuff up. And anybody can make stuff up, of course. But to make it up and make it real, right? Yeah. To make people believe it, that's, that's so hard to do. I'm, I'm writing a I'm writing a murder scene right now. I must have. I mean, I was writing on the plane on the way down from San Francisco, and I was I sat three hours in the airport lounge writing, and I just wrote it over and over and over and over and over again because I, you know, I've never killed anybody. I've never been to a murder scene, never never <laughs> seen a fresh corpse at a murder scene, and trying to get it right to make it believable is so hard. Gosh, it's a nightmare. Oh yeah. Now, now the fact that you are writing a murder scene that leads me to my next question here. What ambitions do you have for another book or maybe even a sequel for this? Um, well, there is actually a. I, I sold two books um, at one time. I sold two books to Macmillan, my U.S. publisher. So there's another book that has been written and it's currently being edited, line edited, and I'm hoping will come out in June of next year. And the the title for that book is, is Hudson's Kill. A kill, obviously, being a body of water, but also a kill being, you know, a kill. Yeah. So, yeah. Nice little doodle on there. Yeah, that so, was a pretty um, good punny, punny not thing. Bad. You did. <laughs> not bad, right? You saw that? Uh, yeah, so that's going to come out next year. And right now I'm pitching two more. So I'm pitching a series now that could go as, as, as many as four. Um, if I if I get if I sell these two on the back of the, the sales of the Devil's Half Mile, so we'll see. And you know, I, I've got plans for like maybe a series that could go eight or ten. I think. Wow. Now, and that's another question I have. Because, you know, we've talked about a lot of this on the show. We've talked about setting up your business plan with your book, okay? Now, mm-hmm. you deal with financial markets. You deal with finances all the time. When you approach your book and you approach things like that, do you kind of think of it as a business plan? Um, yeah, I kind of did because I realized, you know, I've written books before and none of them very good. And one of the reasons is because... You know, I've been writing it over a long period of time, and I realized that in order to, just the way that I work, because I need like a solid block of time in order to write, and in order to get that solid block of time, I needed to quit my job. Mm. And in order to quit my job, I needed to make sure that, you know, financially I was in, in good shape. So, you know, I was very kind of committed to making sure that my life was coherent enough and, and stable enough and manageable enough so that I could actually give myself the time in order to write. So I guess that's kind of phase one of the of the business plan, right? Is actually giving yourself that's the that's the product side. It's like you know enabling the product to be manufactured. Mm-hmm. But then then there's the the stuff that goes on after that. It's like okay, so once you've got this thing in the world and you've 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 sold it, that's and that's another thing is like the sell selling of it. You've then got to market it beyond that right so you sold you sell it to the publisher but then you've got to sell it then you and the publisher have to get together to sell it to um to sell it to the world and in a way that's a kind of a it's it's i guess it's almost like if you were making a product that you were going to you're going to sell to walmart so walmart buys it and walmart's kind of a huge distributor you don't just stop there and let walmart sell it you're still going out and doing your own marketing as well so, you know, I think it's very like just making a regular product that, that people make and sell through um, sell through other retailers or sell through retailers if you're, if you're a product manufacturer. And I think that thinking about it that way is actually pretty helpful for writers because we have to understand that, of course, we want to be artists. But if, if you want to be an, a, success, a commercially successful artist, you've got you to gotta, you gotta think commercially. You've got to sell. You've mm-hmm. got to get out there and you've got to flog your product just like any other widget or, you know, piece of jewelry or furniture or whatever it is. You've, you've got to get it through the distributor and you've got to get it out to the public and you've got to get with the word out. Otherwise, it ain't going to sell and you're not going to make much money. Yeah. I mean, think about Beanie Babies, right? If you were to mm. take a book and compare it to Beanie Babies, okay, nowhere on the face of this planet were people able to walk into a store without seeing a damn beanie baby on a shelf. Mm-hmm. It was like they their plan was just golden because they didn't stop at one distributor. They went all out. They went to every distributor they could. They, they put it out anywhere they could. Basically, they flooded the market with these damn beanie babies. And it's almost like you got to do the same thing with your book. You got to get out there. You got to network. You got to connect with these distributors. And you got to let people know, 
what your book's yeah, all you, about. It, you're absolutely right. And if you think about if you think about Beanie Babies, right? I mean, Beanie Babies became a kind of a viral phenomenon because everybody bought them and everybody saw them, and it was like this whole oh, you've got to have Beanie Babies, blah blah blah. But but I think it was Thai. It was a Thai corporation, mm-hmm. and so Thai. They didn't, they didn't have a website back then, right? They weren't selling stuff themselves. They weren't selling Beanie Babies themselves. They weren't in the street going buy my Beanie Baby. Mm-hmm. They had to find distributors, mm-hmm. right? So, and the difference, I guess, between Ty and, and, uh, and a writer is that we really only have one distributor to go through. I mean, it's a distribution, the distribution networks of bookshops, of course, mm-hmm. but really we have to go through this publisher, right? Who it can... If you, if you think about it, can, can control everything, if you let them control everything. Mm. And I think that the mistake is relying too much on that publisher, right? I mean, Thai is going, Thai went out and it tried to get its product. It had a, it negotiated its product into every store that it could, mm. right? That's what I think you need to do as a, uh, as a writer, because your publisher is only going to work on your book for like the first you know, two months after it comes out, right? And then it's going to move on to the next product. At which point, you somebody needs to pick up the slack, and you need to be out there going to bookstores, you know, telling them about yourself, maybe doing readings if you're if you're traveling to. I'm not saying that you you know who's got that the, the amount of money that they can travel around mm-hmm. the world on their own. But if you're going places in your in your own market, if you're going to towns in your own neighborhood, in in the, in the state that you're in, go to the bookstores in those towns, speak to those people, ask them if they want you to do a reading. At the very least, go in and sign a couple of copies of the book. Mm-hmm. And you, you kind of bring up you kind of bring up a, a whole other point that most people kind of overlook, especially authors, is you yourself are a portion of your product. So you might write your book, and it might be an excellent book, but you have to also keep in mind that you are also a product. You can go mm-hmm. out there and show yourself and say, you know what, mm-hmm. I, I want to do a reading, I want to mm-hmm. do some book signings, and those are things that, in a lot of cases, you know, obviously without the travel expenses, a lot of those things are free to do. And in for example, people who come on this show, the authors that come on this show, this is a free thing for them to do, but they're getting their name out there. And, you know, it's it's just like saying, hey, I am the product too, because that is my story that I created. And just like with the Thai Corporation, okay, they didn't stop with Beanie Babies, because honestly, you talk to somebody under the age of 22, and they're going to be like, what the hell is a Beanie Baby? Um, right. <laughs> but they do recognize those big-eyed things with the small body sitting in just about every store now too, where the, you know, they got that crystallized and it looks like a staring at you, kind of creepy little fuzzy things, but they're by the Thai corporation, which also means that they're moving on to the next level by improving their product and moving further. They, they, they come out with something new. And that's another thing that authors need to think about too, is constantly writing, constantly coming up with something new so that they can stay fresh. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think that this whole notion of you as a, as a product, you as a brand, a lot of people really shy away from that. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't have to be, and I understand, oh, I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a shill, you know, I'm an artist. It's like, okay, that's fine, but don't tell me you don't enjoy talking about your book. Don't oh, yeah. tell me you don't enjoy talking about your process. So don't just talk to people in, a, in, in your living room about that. Get out and tell people in the world, you know, and, and you don't, if you're, if you're shy and you don't want to speak in front of people, that's fine. Blog about it, yeah. right? You know, you know, get yourself. There are so many digital ways to get yourself out there now that there's really no excuse for not doing it. You just have to find the right means for you. It just happens mm. that I like, I like doing all of it. But I'm, you know, I'm good at standing up in front of people and blah blah blah. So that's <laughs> lucky. It's lucky for me, right? I mean, that's. But I, I count myself very fortunate. I'm not so good at the other stuff. I'm not a good blogger, right? And I enjoy doing it when I do it, but I'm not very good at it. So mm-hmm. but there are people out there who are great bloggers. I say, get yourself out there that way. Get yourself on the, on the platforms like Goodreads and you know, the Barnes & Noble site and all the rest of it. All of these places where people are interested in books, put yourself out there. And that's the way that you connect with potential readers. And that's the way that you, you start selling your book. And I think you know, you've know just got to experiment with these things and, and you know, put yourself out there. Because if you don't put yourself out there, nobody's going to know you exist. Nobody's going to stumble upon you, right? Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, they might, of course, but the chances are they won't. Yeah. Now, that leads me to the to the final question that we have here, and, and we usually ask just about every one of the authors on the show. What is a little bit of advice that you would give to a brand new author, somebody who's just getting their feet wet? Um, so I would say, um, you know, the usual stuff. It's like write write every day, 
right? Write every day, even if it's only five minutes a day. Write every day. This is a writer who kind of mentored me a little bit from my first book. He was like, just you only have to do five minutes because sometimes five minutes is just five minutes, but sometimes five minutes can turn into five hours. And these days, there's no excuse for not doing five minutes, right? Mm-hmm. You can. You can you can be sitting on the subway with your with your iPhone or whatever, and you can like tap you can tap out your thoughts of like oh this is the way the plot's going right now you know do five to ten minutes just you know sending yourself a memo but just keep the story in your head the whole time because if you're if you're living that story all the time you're thinking about it all the time there's no choice but to put it on the page yeah right and and you keep that story alive in your head by writing about it. If you're, all you're doing is thinking, I'm sorry, that's not going to keep the story alive and that's not going to get it written. The only way it gets written is if you put words down on the page. Mm-hmm. But the, the great part of that is if you do put words down on the page, it keeps writing itself. Yeah. The other thing I would say, and this is like a really practical thing, is that when you're writing your, when you're writing your, your, your novel or whatever, or your, whatever it is that you're writing, read your work out loud and do that as oh, much as yes. possible. Yes. Yeah? It's, a, it's a, one of the best tips anybody gave me. And you know, it's like you finish a chapter – and then read it out loud because when you read it out loud, you'll be like, oh my gosh, this, this shouldn't be here. That's not right. Syntac- syntactically, this is wrong. The voice here isn't correct. I have to lose this bit. This is all wordy and weird. I mean, really, it can really, really help you and yeah. really tie, your, tie yourself down. Yeah, for somebody who reads books, okay, <laughs> that's, what, that's what I do. Um, I mean, I read them to my family and things like that because reading it out loud does bring it more to life. It, it corrects all those little errors and, and you notice it right away, okay? But yeah, I want to thank you so much for being here on the show, Patty. I mean, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. And um, another thing, too, they can find your book, The Devil's Half Mile, um, on Amazon, just like everybody else. But where else can they find your book? Well, it's on all of the usual places, you know, so you can get it in most bookstores. Barnes and Nobles is, is stocking it. It's on and um, you, you can get it electronically. Of course, the ebooks are available. See if you can get it in your local library. Apparently, library purchases have been pretty good, which is great. And of course, there's an audio book as well. So I don't know if you um, if you're familiar with the, the musical Hamilton. Oh, the, yeah. Um, yeah, the guy uh, who's, who uh, plays King George in, in Hamilton, a fellow called Ewan Morton, he's a great Scottish actor. He's actually voiced the, the book, and it's, it's really good. I read it, the, I listened to it the other day. I was like, wow, it's made me think about my own book in a whole different way, which is fantastic. So it's very, I, I, I really recommend it. If you're into audiobooks, it's, 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 a, it's a great one to listen to. All right. And your YouTube page, your, your YouTube page, is that just underneath uh, Patty Hirsch? That's just underneath Patty Hirsch, yeah. And there's also the blog, which is, you know, not that much on the blog, but I, I'm up there every now and again. That's uh, pattyhirsch.com, P-A-D-D-Y-H-I-R-S-C-H. And then, of course, I'm, very, I'm always happy to communicate and chat with people on Twitter and Facebook and, of course, on uh, Instagram. So, you know, look for me in all those places because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty active. All right, we'll be listening to you on NPR because that is like my go-to station. Um, awesome. <laughs> I Good love man. Keep listening. Um, but anyhow, uh, thank you again for being here on the show. Thank you, Emmett. It's been a pleasure. Oh, yeah, it's been a very good pleasure. And uh, this is Emmett Blackwell signing out. Keep on reading and keep on writing, my friends. Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. 